Итак, дорогие друзья, с вами проект «Эшкалот» и издательство «Книжники». Сегодня с нами, помимо автора Филиппа Сенца, который присоединяется к нам из Лондона, главный редактор издательства «Книжники», которое, собственно, издало эту книгу, Борох Горин, журналист, а также специальный корреспондент русской службы «Радио Свобода» Елена Фанайлова, которая будет вести беседу с Филиппом Сенцем. Мы начинаем с главного редактора издательства «Книжники» Бороха Горина, который скажет несколько слов о том, почему издательство решило издать эту книгу. Добрый вечер, дорогие друзья. Да, действительно, необычное у нас сегодня событие, необычная презентация, но, кто знает, может быть, так оно получится и лучше. Дело в том, что Семен, когда спрашивает по поводу того, почему наше издательство сделает эту книгу, я должен сказать, что эту книгу мы бы делали, вот эту книгу, вот она у меня в руках, имейте в виду, она вот такая красивая и вот такая толстая. И мы эту книгу бы, скорее всего, издавали, даже если бы она была не слишком интересной. Я сейчас объясню, что я имею в виду. Эта книга — это, в общем, документальное исследование. И Автор книги — мирового класса юрист, поэтому исследование предсказуемо фундировано, предсказуемо сделано не только логически, но и документально абсолютно разносторонне. И таким образом книга обречена на то, чтобы быть источником важнейших исторических сведений. Но именно с такими мыслями я взял эти, эту книгу, манускрипт этой книги, в руку в свое время для того, чтобы э, начать над ней работать. И меня э, ждало, ждало изумление, и изумление э, несколько трудное для моих глаз, потому что оторваться я от этой книги не мог. Э, я ее прочитал, а это 500 с лишним страниц вот русского текста теперь, я ее прочитал буквально за сутки, ни на что другое не отвлекаясь. Э, и дело тут вот в чем. Это настоящий документальный детектив. И несмотря на э, сугубую, сугубо академическую форму, э, формулу на обложке происхождения терминов геноцид и преступления против человечества, что полная правда, а об этом э, о целой битве выдающихся юристов XX века в этой книге э, идет речь. Однако э, книга это, — это документальный детектив, как уже было сказано, поскольку Филипп э, приехав во Львов, на родину своих предков, стал изучать историю своей семьи, значит, соответственно, историю жертв. И увлекся настолько, что стал изучать историю палачей. И эта встреча стала еще и встречей потомков. В общем, эта книга, она сделала бы честь любому билетристу, поскольку э, психологически это настолько интересно и настолько э, волнует э, история этих людей, причем для меня совершенно поразительно было, что людей с обеих сторон, э, что я уверен, вас эта книга заинтересует так же, как меня. Но кроме всего прочего, э, надо понимать, что мы книгу издали в, в юбилейный год, ну, полуюбилейный, назовем так. И мы говорим, в общем, о истории войны, которая все становится дальше от молодого, особенно читателя, от будущих поколений, поколениях от всех читателей. И становясь дальше, она становится гораздо более отдаленной и психологически от нас. И вот Филиппу Сенсу удалось сделать так, что эти герои, они живые, что за статистикой, за страшными цифрами, миллионами жертв стоят люди, люди очень современные, это не предание давно минувших лет. И именно поэтому эта книга становится твоим личным опытом. Поэтому я не, не только не, не задаюсь вопросом, почему мы это издали, а для меня совершенно очевидно, что это огромная честь для нашего издательства сделать эту книгу. Я очень благодарен автору Филиппу Сенсу, я рад нашему, пусть виртуальному, но в глаза в глаза сейчас знакомству. И я завидую тем, кто эту книгу еще не прочел, потому что вас ждет по-настоящему увлекательное чтение. Одна ремарка, 
Эта книга вышла сначала из близких нам языков на украинском языке. И мне кажется, это невероятно важно. Но, тем не менее, мне кажется, что она актуально прозвучит не менее актуально, чем для украинцев, для современных украинцев и для современных россиян, для современных людей, говорящих на русском языке. Думаю, что многое в сознании она должна перевернуть. И надеюсь, что она это сделает. А я бы хотел с разрешения Семёна сделать ещё несколько ремарк. Это важно сказать, что я говорил много сейчас об авторе, и о содержании книги, но книга такого рода особенно, очень сложная книга, невероятно зависит от переводчика. И Людмила Сум, переводчица этой книги, простите, Любовь Сум, переводчица этой книги, сделала совершенно замечательный, на мой взгляд, перевод. Это виртуозная работа. Я слышал, не видел украинцев, а что украинский перевод сделан прекрасно. Надеюсь, мы выдержим конкуренцию, и русский перевод не хуже украинского, тем более, что, насколько мне известно, Любовь работала и в тесном контакте с украинскими переводчиками. А, кроме того, я хочу сказать, что в наше сложное время, когда в магазины книжные уже и не зайти, то в Москве, в том числе и в наш, а мы предлагаем покупать эту книгу на сайте. На нашем сайте книжники.ру вы можете получить скидку 30%. Если вы впишете в комментарий, к заказу слова «эшкалот». Кстати, это замечательное время для того, чтобы сказать спасибо, эшкалот, за наш сегодняшний вечер. Так что всем огромное спасибо и еще раз огромное спасибо Филиппу. Барух, спасибо большое. И я с удовольствием переношусь в лондонскую самоизоляцию Филиппа Сенса. И мы попросим Филиппа сейчас рассказать о том, как родился, собственно, замысел этой книги и почему он вдруг в какой-то момент решил ее написать. Пожалуйста, Филипп. Sure. Well, can I just begin by thanking you, the publishing house, and your whole team for publishing into Russian. Uh, it's very meaningful for me. Uh, I think it's a book that has a big resonance. Uh, for many people in Russia. Uh, I'm very sorry that I can't be with you today as I was supposed to be in Moscow. Uh, I haven't been in Moscow for 30 years uh, since I went to visit my good friend Orlando Fijis when he was a student there. Uh, but I'm hoping to come later in the autumn uh, when this epidemic uh, has settled down. So I'm very happy to be published uh, in Russian. It's the first time, although I have many good friends Uh, in Russia, and I've worked very closely uh, with Russia. Um, let me say a little bit about how this story began. I'm a professor at the university, and I'm a lawyer. I'm a litigator, a barrister. Uh, I do cases before international courts, and I do cases about mass atrocity, about crimes against humanity and genocide. And 10 years ago, in 2010, I received, uh, out of the blue, an invitation to visit the university in the city of Lviv in Ukraine. Would I like to come and give a lecture on the cases that I do, on the work that I do, on crimes against humanity and genocide? Crimes against humanity is about the protection of individuals. Genocide is about the protection of groups. Yes, I said, I would love uh, to come. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really know where Lviv was, but I discovered very quickly that Lviv is also Lvov, Lvov in Polish, and Lemberg in German. It's also Leopolis in Italian. And the moment I realized the city was the same as Lemberg, I decided that I want to go. Why? Because my grandfather was born there in 1904. Uh, he lived there uh, until 1914. Uh, the Russians then occupied the city for about a year and a half, and he left for Vienna. And by the time I knew him, I was born in 1960, he was living in Paris, and I always knew him as a Frenchman. I didn't know anything about the past in Vienna, and certainly not Lvov. So I accepted the invitation because I wanted to to put it very simply, find the house where my grandfather was born. It was a journey to discover who he was, 
and to discover who I was. So I accepted the invitation. That was the spring of 2010. I arrived in Lviv in October 2010, and by then I'd done a bit of research. I prepared the lecture that I was going to give, and I came across two accidental discoveries. The first thing that I discovered was that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law, uh, that was in 1945 for the Nuremberg trial in the charter of the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal, the man was called Hirsch Lauterpacht, and he came from Lviv. And then I discovered that the man who invented the concept of genocide, the crime of killing of groups, Raphael Lemkin, which was also invented in 1945, also came from the city of Lviv. In fact, both men, Lauterpacht and Lemkin, had been students at the law faculty which had invited me but the people who had invited me did not know that fact. So when I arrived in Lviv in October 2010, I came with some surprising news. This English man arrives from London to explain to them that the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide start in the classrooms of the law faculty of the University of Lviv. So that was pretty amazing. Everyone in Lviv was sort of excited and happy about that. And about four or five months later, I decided I would write a book about the three men, my grandfather Leon Buchholz, Hirsch Lauterpacht, and Raphael Lemkin. And I started writing that book. And then a fourth man came into the story. And the fourth man was Hans Frank. Hans Frank was Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to 1933. And in 1933, he became a minister of justice. And then in 1939, he was appointed governor general of German occupied Poland. When the war began in 1939, as many of you will know, from the West, Poland was occupied by Germany. And from the East, it was occupied by the Soviet Union. The pact between Germany and the Soviet Union divided Poland. And Frank became the governor based in Krakow. In 1941, Germany broke the pact with the Soviet Union and headed East. And within a few days, they had occupied the city of Lviv and the district of Galicia and the Nazis took power, and they began to implement their regime of terror. And what I learned was that in August 1942, Hans Frank traveled from Krakow to Lviv. He gave a lecture in the university, coincidentally in the same room where I would later give a lecture, and he announced the extermination of the entire Jewish population of the district of Galicia, and of course also many Polish nationals, hundreds of thousands of people, if not more. And amongst the people who were killed in the period beginning in August 1942 through to March 1943 was my family, and my grandfather's family, the family of Lauterpacht and the family of Lemkin. And so I thought I would introduce Hans Frank into the story. Why? Because uh, and life is often full of surprises and miracles. It's what came next that was particularly amazing. Hans Frank was caught by the American army in May 1945. He was arrested. He was... Uh, charged with crimes against humanity and genocide, and he was put on trial in the famous Nuremberg trial. He was prosecuted by the Soviets, the Americans, the British, and the French. And 
remarkably, uh, you know, fact is stranger than fiction. You could not invent such a story. The British prosecution team hire Lauterpacht, the inventor of the concept of crimes against humanity, to prosecute Frank. And the Americans hire Raphael Lemkin, who by now is a refugee in the United States, to uh, prosecute Hans Frank. And so you get this extraordinary case in which Lauterpacht and Lemkin are prosecuting Hans Frank but they do not know that the man they are prosecuting has killed their entire families. The trial starts in November 1945. It's in fact the Soviet prosecutors who lead the case on the crimes that are committed in Lviv. And at that point in November 1945, exactly 75 years ago, the prosecutors do not know the fate of their families. They do not know if their families are alive or are well. And so I tell in the book the story of the uh, trial, the prosecution by Lauterpacht and Lemkin of Hans Frank. And so East West Street is really two stories, a double detective story. The heart of the story really is the city of Lviv in which so much started and the lives of these four men, but it's basically a double detective story. There is the big political, legal, historical drama, the crimes that were committed, the trial at Nuremberg, the prosecution, and that is the story of the three men. But there is also in parallel the story of my own family. And I return to this to conclude my introduction. I didn't know anything about my grandfather's past. I didn't know what had happened to him. I knew that he was born in Lviv, in Lemberg, in 1904. And through the research, I discovered his story. In 1914, he moved with his mother and his two sisters from Lviv to Vienna. His father and brother had both died in the first days of the war. The First World War. He lived in Vienna until 1939. In 1939, he was married. He had a child of one year who was my mother. And he left for Paris. I always thought that he went to Paris with his wife and his child. But in doing the research, I discovered that that was not the case. He had left for Paris by himself in January 1939. My mother followed in July 1939 by herself, and her mother remained in Vienna and did not get to Paris until early 1942. And so I had a number of family questions. Why did my grandfather leave by himself? How on earth did my mother get from Vienna to Paris by herself, and why did my grandmother choose to stay behind in Vienna when she could have left for Paris with her daughter and her husband? So these were family mysteries alongside the bigger political mystery. To conclude, uh, it's a book, I think, that seems to have a universal interest. It's concerned about identity, it's concerned about silence, it's about the relationship between the individual and the group. You have these two crimes, crimes against humanity for the protection of the individual, genocide for the protection of the group. But throughout the book is this beating heart of a question, who are we, how do we identify ourselves? Are we individuals or are we members of a group? And that concludes my introduction, and I'm very happy now to continue the conversation. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое, Филипп Сенс. А сейчас я хотел бы передать слово специальному корреспонденту русской редакции Радио Свобода Елене Фанайловой, которая проведет такое мини-интервью с Филиппом. Пожалуйста, Елена.
Ага, Семен, спасибо. Но ну, если можно, я тоже маленькое вступление себе позволю. Я покажу а, книгу, как я ее впервые увидела. Я ее впервые читала по-украински. Вот она. И если говорить о моем, так сказать, личном, что ли, о моей личной повлеченности вообще в это повествование, оно связано с Моя связана с тем, что издавала эту книгу моя близкая подруга Марьяна Савка, а консультировала русскую версию еще одна моя близкая подруга Марьяна Киановская, которая является замечательным поэтом, переводчиком, автором знаменитой книги, сейчас знаменитой книги, которая называется «Баби Яр», которая появилась в Украине примерно в то же время, когда выходила книга Филиппа, и то есть для меня это очень ну, лично связанные вещи. Я не говорю о том, что я очень люблю Львов и интересуюсь им как литератор, журналист и обозреватель и так далее, и так далее. Конечно, для меня совершенно потрясающая история была в том, что два юриста из Львова, можно сказать, изменили ход послевоенной истории. Я бы добавила, что есть еще и третий юрист, выпускник Львова. Я покажу еще одну обложку. Это, безусловно, Ян Карский, книга, которого, книга воспоминаний которого тоже выходила недавно по-русски. И вот эти три выпускника Львовского университета, я считаю, рассказали миру в общем-то, о Холокосте во всей полноте. А, ну вот как это, наверное, наверное, должно быть. Я считаю, что у книги Филиппа есть, конечно, все качества интеллектуального хита. Это детектив, как верно сказано, это семейная история, и это а, политический, это еще и классический политический детектив, не случайно такой мастер его, как Джон Лекаре, а, делает реплику а, на книгу и как бы очень одобрительно о ней а, говорит. А, ну, вот самый простой вопрос. Вы как юрист, а вы за кого? Вы вообще за кого из своих героев, грубо говоря, вот за Ленкина или за Лаутерпахта? Firstly, can I say, it's so incredibly nice to be in this conversation with you. And uh, I hope at some point we can reproduce it in person together in Moscow. So, as you've understood, the book was for me a sort of personal struggle. If you ask me the question, who would I rather have dinner with? I would probably say Lemkin would be a more interesting dinner companion. He would be interested in the food, he would be interested in the wine, he would tell stories, he would be very entertaining. But intellectually, I think my starting point in the book is with Lauterpacht, whose idea was that in order to protect human lives, you have to focus on the inherent quality of the human individual and protect the individual. Lemkin's theory was different. Lemkin's theory was that people get killed in large numbers because they are members of a group. And in order to protect human beings as individuals, you must protect the group of which they are a member, as nationals, as their race, as their religion, and other things. And so you've got this dichotomy between two theories of why we are valued as human beings, because each of us is an individual and each of us is a member of a group. And so your question is a very personal question, and one in which I essentially gravitate towards the protection of every person because they're individual. But as I was writing the book, something happened, as you trace the story, so that intellectually I'm on a journey with Lauterpacht. But right at the end of the book, I find myself standing at a mass grave outside a small town called Zhovkva, Zhulkiev. It was, in fact, between 1939 
1941, and then beyond it was called Nesterov. Uh, the Soviets called it after a famous astronaut, a like, famous f- fighter pilot. And I have to say that standing next to a mass grave where still today are the bodies of three and a half thousand people, my grandfather's uncles and aunts and cousins and nephews and Lauterpak's uncle and aunt and cousins and nephews together, it was impossible not to feel the power of the connection with the idea that Lemkin had, namely the protection of the group is necessary because people are targeted not because of what they've done, but because of who they are, who their family is, what religion they are, what race they are, what nationality they are. And so I ended up being much more sympathetic than I thought I would be to the idea of Lemkin. А, окей, Филипп, но разве вам не приходилось в качестве юриста-международника, например, иметь дела с геноцидами, геноцид в Сребренице, да, то есть новая практика международных судов, связанных с массовыми убийствами либо по этническому, либо по религиозному принципу, это тоже Руанда. Это то, что, то, с чем человечество начало сталкиваться как с юридической проблемой, как с практической проблемой в 90-е годы. Вот как быть здесь? Как работают оба подхода? Мне, честно говоря, кажется, что правы оба, правы оба ваших героя. И в, ну, просто в каждом вот таком случае, когда международный суд... А что еще важно в вашей книге? Вы говорите о том, что после Второй мировой войны международные суды объявили о том, что никакого суверенного права убивать своих граждан не существует. Мне кажется, это очень важное напоминание в книге. Так вот, что делать со случаями этнических убийств? А такое этническое убийство имеется и на территории бывшего Советского Союза. Например, конфликты в Средней Азии. Вот как решает юрист такую проблему? How do I, as a lawyer, deal with these issues delicately and very carefully? Um, I'm involved in many, many cases of mass killing. Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Congo, Argentina, Chile, uh, Iraq, Syria. I mean, you know, right now I'm very involved in the case involving the Rohingya community in Myanmar, in what used to be called Burma. And you're absolutely right. These cases involve both concepts. Every genocide will also be a crime against humanity. But not every crime against humanity is a genocide. And to prove a genocide in international law is very difficult because you have to prove the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part, and it makes it very difficult to prove. But what has happened over the last 50 years is that in the list of crimes, genocide is now seen as the worst. And so victims are unhappy if the crime which they have been involved in is only called a crime against humanity or a war crime. And this for me is very problematic. It elevates genocide to the crime of crimes so that somehow the other crimes seem less bad or less important. And there's a further problem. It's a deeply philosophical issue that you've raised. It's about identity, it's about who we are. But what the concept of genocide has done is it has elevated the protection of the group to the most important of all crimes. And by doing that, it has elevated the concept of the protection of the group above the protection of the individual. And it has reinforced our sense of group identity, national, racial, religious, and other. And I think there is a real possibility that by reinforcing the sense of group identity, Lemkin's concept of genocide, which is necessary and inevitable, 
has actually given rise to the very conditions that it was intended to prevent. It has made the killing of groups more likely rather than less likely. And this is a, an intellectual problem, a philosophical problem. But the reality is, exactly as you say, both concepts are necessary and both concepts exist. But they're not problem-free. Я не могу с вами не согласиться. Эта проблема, вероятно, актуализируется для нас из-за того, что правые тенденции, политические правые тенденции в всех странах сейчас возрастают и очень легко сыграть на национальных интересах узкой группы. Вы в книге даже приводите пример, когда люди, которые рассуждают о старейшем геноциде, так сказать, признанном, а это геноцид армянского народа, говорят, что пора бы в других терминах об этом, а, об этом а, говорить. Но а, я вспомню другое. Я вспомню, как говорит русский режиссер Олег Дорман. А, он говорит о Холокосте. Холокост — это не то, что произошло с евреями, это то, что произошло со всеми а, людьми и то, что произошло с каждым. А, возможно, это парадокс, согласитесь вы. I mean, I mean, let's talk about your question in terms of what we are living right now. We have, we have this virus called coronavirus. It doesn't discriminate against any human being. It touches every human being, whatever their religion, whatever their sexual orientation, whatever their color, whatever their nationality. We are in this problem together and equally. And yet today, with the rise of nationalism, what do we find in our British newspapers? We find the government of the United Kingdom blaming China for what has happened. Is this a helpful thing to do? No, it's not helpful at all. We have to recognize that we have to work together as a single community to sort out this problem. And just as with coronavirus, when an attack takes place in Myanmar on the Rohingya community, or in Srebrenica on the Bosnian Muslim community, or in Rwanda, or in Argentina, or anywhere else, it's an attack on the whole of humanity. That is Lauterpak's idea of a crime against humanity. So I absolutely agree with the vision articulated by the Russian director. We're in this together. And that was exactly what I argued last December at the International Court of Justice when I was the lawyer for a small African country called the Gambia, which brought a case against Myanmar alleging genocide. Why Gambia? Because Gambia said an attack on the community of the Rohingya in Myanmar is attack on all of us, and anyone in the world and any country has the right to respond to it. So I fully subscribe to the view of this fine Russian director. Да, я бы еще про коронавирус сказала такое. Вот сегодня за два часа до нашего а, вот, вот этого разговора я увидела, как Борух написал у себя на странице в Фейсбуке, как он бешено волнуется за своих родителей в Америке. И я тут же представила а, чувство ваших а, деда и бабки, а, да, то есть чувство Леона, который не понимает, где его семья. А, и, и также для того, чтобы, возможно, мы все лучше представили, что, себя, что себе представляли, что переживали люди во время Второй мировой войны, будучи вынуждены иммигрировать, разделяться, а, волноваться за своих близких. И это как не Парадоксально, это очень похоже на то, что происходит сейчас. А, но а, вот я хотела спросить у вас, переходя уже к частной истории семьи Филипп, вы довольно часто а, говорите о том, что Леон все время молчал, Рита тоже была очень скрытной женщиной, а, и вам приходилось преодолевать этот заговор молчания. И вы узнали кое-что, 
что, наверное, семья хотела скрывать и сама от себя, и друг от друга. А вам даже пришлось давать ДНК для того, чтобы понять, в каких степенях родства, кто с кем а, там, у вас а, со, соотносится. Вот давайте про этот заговор молчания, что ли, скажем. Он очень похож на заговор молчания в России у старшего поколения по отношению к младшему. Как раз вот а, наше с вами поколение пытается выяснить правду, вся, в том числе и работой в архивах, и попытками переговоров со старшими и так далее. Что вы про этот заговор молчания думаете? И у них такая психотерапия была, они пытались а, спасти свою психику от того, что с ними произошло. Well, how long have you got? I could talk about this for hours. Um, the, the, the reality is that one of the wonderful things about the human being is that there isn't a single human being on the planet who doesn't have secrets. And one of the things that I became very interested in is how secrets get transmitted onto the next generations. You know, I opened the book with a quotation from two Hungarian psychoanalysts, Nicholas Abraham and Maria Torok. The book opens with what are maybe the most important words in the book, What haunts us are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And I knew that my grandfather had secrets. And I knew as a grandson, I could be curious about them and I could try to discover them. But he never once talked to me about what happened during the war. I knew as a little boy, You did not ask these questions. And one of the things that I discovered in writing this book was that the same silence exists on the other side of the story. You've read the book, so you understand curiously, because I researched like a lawyer, I wanted to learn more about this man, Hans Frank. And I found his son, Nicholas who is a wonderful journalist. He's now 80 years old. He has become a very good friend. How curious that I would become a friend with the son of Hans Frank. But he described to me the silence in his family when he was growing up. His father was charged with the murder of four million human beings. I mean, that is, you know, I can't even imagine what it's like to have a father who is said to have killed four million people. And Nicholas grew up in a family of silences. And also Horst Wächter, the son of Frank's deputy, Otto Wächter, who I'm writing the next book about, called The Rat Line. So silence is something we all with, live with. I would be surprised if you don't have silences. And that caused me to engage in a sort of detective story to find out what really happened. And I don't want to give everything away because I describe in the book how a lawyer finds information about their own family. The only thing that I would say is this. If you are thinking of having an intimate relationship, an affair with someone else, do not assume that 75 years later, one of your grandchildren can discover with absolute certainty who you had that affair with and what happened in that love story, because that is what I discovered. My grandmother had a love story with another man, and no one in my family had ever talked about it, and I discovered the truth 70 years later. So armed with tiny pieces of paper and tiny pieces of information, it is possible to construct a sort of narrative And that's what I do in East West Street on the family story. I reconstruct a very painful family episode. Um, but it also has rather positive elements and rather happy sides, such as the lady who saved my mother's life. So it's a very complicated story indeed, as you say. 
Давайте мы расскажем об этой женщине, потому что я собиралась спросить э, о ней. Э, ну, это, там есть несколько обставных глав, совершенно невероятных, которые вроде бы не имеют отношения к главному детективу. А давайте, кто такая мисс Тилни? Before I went to Lviv in the summer of 2010, I said to my mother, I want to find my grandfather's house. I want to find your father's house in Lviv. But I've got nothing. What documents do you have? She went to her bedroom. She came back with two big bags full of papers, which I had never seen. I was 50 years old. This was the first time I saw this. And I spread everything out all over the floor. I found passports, Nazi passports, Austrian passports, Polish passports, all sorts of incredible material. And then one tiny piece of paper, which said on it a name and address. I've put it in the book. You've seen it. Miss E.M. Tilney, Manuka. Bluebell House, Norwich, Angleterre. I England. I say to my mother, who is this lady? My mother says, I don't know. And I don't believe her. I think she does know. But she doesn't want to tell me. So I go off on a detective story that lasts four years. And I discover the story of an incredible woman an evangelical Christian missionary who was living in Paris, who met my grandfather in Paris, who was very poor and needed handouts of food. And my grandfather asked if she'd go to Vienna and save his daughter, which she did. And she went to Vienna and brought a one-year-old child back to Paris. There was a second child who was older, my mother's cousin, and at the very last minute, her mother could not bear to be separated from her. And so she stayed, and within a year, she was dead. Within a couple of years, she was dead. And I became very interested in this woman, Miss Tilney, and I discovered and describe her story. It turns out she saved a lot of people's lives. And she did so because of a particular interpretation of Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapter 10, verse 1. I exist because of Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, and I became fascinated by this remarkable lady. And I decided in the end that although it was not strictly necessary, people would be interested, and it's plain they are interested because the book has been translated into many languages, including now Russian, which I am so happy about. And the most remarkable thing about Miss Tilney was that she didn't tell a single person what she had done. I discovered what she'd done, and I told her family what she had done 70 years after she did it, 80 years after she did it. Uh, unlike today where people do things and they put them on Facebook and Twitter and the internet, she did something remarkable and she told nobody. And I'm very happy that I discovered it. Я скажу больше. Благодаря вашей книге об этом узнало государство Израиль. И ныне мисс Тилни является праведницей мира. Я так понимаю, что это все-таки ваша а, заслуга как исследователя и человека. У нас, у нас вопрос из Москвы от Елены, просто про хронологию. Какая, какие годы от начала до конца охватывает ваше описание? My book covers uh, 1914 to 1946. And it tells the lives of these four people not in strict chronology, backwards and forwards in time. It was a very complicated structure, 
because how you tell four different stories is not an easy way to do it. I have a wonderful editor in New York and in London who helped me greatly with it. But I have to say the story isn't actually over <laughs> because I got to know these remarkable people, son of Hans Frank and the son of Otto Wechter. A second book is about to come out in England, which tells the next part of the story, what happened afterwards, what happened between 1946 and 1950. And of course, that story becomes incredibly relevant for Russia today, as it is relevant for America and for Britain today. One of the small characters in East West Street is a man called Otto Wächter, who was the governor of Krakow and the governor of Galicia and Lviv. And like Frank, he was indicted for mass murder. But unlike Frank, he was never caught. He disappeared. He disappeared off the face of the earth on the 9th of May, 1945. He reappeared four years later in Rome, in the Vatican, in a hospital, dead. And the next book, which is called The Rat Line, is the story of what happened in those four and a half years. And it's a story about the Cold War. It's a story about how the alliance between Britain, America, and the Soviet Union collapsed after 1946 and an iron curtain descended between East and West. And Wächter got caught up in that struggle. And I could not believe what I discovered because what the rat line essentially tells is the story of how the Americans and the British hired senior Nazis in the struggle against the Soviets, against the Russians. And so one of the things I'm now having to deal with in East West Street and in the rat line is this central relationship between East and West, between the British, the Americans, the French on the one hand, the Russians on the other hand, and how this infects our modern European history in so many ways, still today in Ukraine. As you know from East West Street, there is a scene in the book where I visit a small town called Brody, the home actually of the great writer Joseph Roth. And I visit the recreation of a battle between the Waffen-SS Galicia Division and the Red Army, which is enacted, reenacted every summer. And you find Ukrainians from the far right dressed up in SS uniforms, pretending that they're taking on the Soviets. I was amazed, I couldn't believe that I was seeing this. And I came to understand how in parts of the Ukraine, there is a strand which remains obviously in a very complex and difficult relationship with Russia and with the former Soviet Union. None of this was expected to me when I started doing the research on the book. Uh, and it is a continuing story. Насколько я понимаю, этот эпизод отражен в фильме «Что сделали наши отцы», где вы, собственно, появляетесь с обоими сыновьями и Вектором, и Франком, то есть Хорст, с Хорстом Вектором, который оправдывает своего отца, и Николасом, который, наоборот, ну, собственно, ярые антифашисты и своего отца осуждает. Я правильно понимаю? Nicholas Frank. Um, the viewers mustn't forget, it's, I don't only write books and teach at the university. Um, indeed. Um, so I research not only like a writer and a historian, but also as uh, I write also as a lawyer. And so when I do my research, I research very, very carefully. I came across a book 
that was published in 1987 by Nicholas Frank, um, which was called in German, Der Vater, The Father. And it was a biography of his father, Hans Frank. And it was a book of hatred of his father. So I thought I want to meet this man, Nicholas. I wrote to him, I found him. He invited me to meet with him near Hamburg. We met and the first thing he did was he said to me, Philippe, you know, I hate my father. I am against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. And the second thing he did was he put his hand inside his jacket pocket and he took out a photograph. And it was a photograph of his father's dead body. I was surprised. It's not often what you do in London. People don't show you pictures of their dead father. I said, why are you showing me that? He said, because every day I have to remind myself that my father is indeed truly dead. He hates his father. And then he said to me, but you know, not everyone is like me. Why maybe you'd like to meet my friend Horst, the son of Otto Wechter. You'll like him, he's a nice person, but he likes his father and he thinks his father is a good man. And so Nicholas and I went to visit Horst and Horst was, as Nicholas said, a lovely man, but who thinks his father was a good person who essentially freed the Ukrainian spirit. It didn't matter that he killed hundreds of thousands of Poles and Jews. He had liberated the Ukrainian spirit. So it was a very complex relationship. And I had two sons, exactly as you say, one who hates his father, one who likes his father, and together we went to Lviv, and together we met the people who celebrate the creation of the Waffen-SS Galicia Division. And we made a film about it, which I think you will be able to see. It's on iTunes, it's on Amazon, you can watch it. It was a very strange day. And yes, indeed, Horst was very happy to meet these people who told him his father was a wonderful man. Uh, uh, Nicholas was less happy. Знаете, довольно важное замечание в вашей книге, что эта группа людей является маргиналами. А когда я смотрела эпизод из фильма, я убедилась в этом еще раз. Они очень напоминают русских реконструкторов. То есть людей, которые играют а, в войну благодаря своим а, патриотическим, ультрапатриотическим, квазипатриотическим и, в общем, честно говоря, очень правым взглядом. Более того, я не могу здесь не вспомнить, что а, главный игрок в реконструкцию а, — это Игорь Стрелков-Гиркин, который является одним из а, основных акторов а, развязывания военных действий на востоке Украины. Так что я полагаю, что это а, довольно опасная часть общества. Это, это милитаризированные мужчины без а, особого или определенного рода занятий. Я прошу прощения за этот комментарий, а, и, но этот эпизод действительно очень показательный. И вопрос у меня, как вам удалось не поссориться Например, с Хорстом, с которым вы явно находитесь на разных э, полюсах. И вообще, ну, э, говоря честно, его отец убил вашу родню. Да? Есть еще не менее потрясающий эпизод вашего разговора в синагоге в Жолпе, где вы обсуждаете эту тему. Так вот, э, как вам удалось не... Э, э, во, ну, вообще много чего сделать, там фильм этот снять, эту книгу написать. Как вам удалось не поругаться? И не поругались ли в конце концов Хорст и Миклас? So, firstly, thank you for what you said about the Ukrainian situation today, because my experience is the same as yours. The people that we saw in a field outside Brody were a marginal, small number of people. They did not represent the mainstream of the Ukrainian community that I met with. I owe a big debt to extraordinary young Ukrainian scholars, 
and historians without whom I would never have been able to do my research. And they were as horrified as I was by what they saw that day. I mean, truly horrified and very upset about it. And they felt a sense of shame that I had seen such a thing. You're absolutely right. Uh, the relationship with Horst is complex. Uh, he is not a bad person and he is not a Nazi. Uh, he struggles to find the good in his father. And he adopts a position that, you know, sometimes I have real difficulty with and I disagree with fundamentally. But I suppose it is my training, you know, as a, as, as a lawyer. When I'm in court, one of the rules that you have as an English barrister, as a lawyer, one, you know, we wear the wig when we're in court, is you don't show emotion. Don't reveal your true feelings. You adopt a stand which is completely flat. You ask questions, get answers, you ask the next question. And almost 100%, I maintained with Horst my equilibrium. But if you've seen the film, my Nazi legacy, you will know that there is a moment where I lose my temper with him. I get very upset. And it is a scene in the aula of the university where I find a document which shows that his father has been indicted for mass murder, the killing of more than 100,000 Poles and Jews. Horst looks at this piece of paper. There is a pause, and then he says, yes, but this is a Russian document. <laughs> As though that makes any difference at all. I just, you know, I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, why is that a, why does that help? Why does that help justify what your father did? And I got very, very upset with him uh, at this moment. My friend who makes the film, it's his film, it's not my film, he decided to put the scene in the film. I'm not so comfortable with the scene because I prefer to be flat and not lose my temper, but I did occasionally lose my temper. You're absolutely right. Ну, в книге легче скрыть ваши чувства, а в фильме это все, конечно, в этой сцене это все просто видно очень наглядно и эмоционально. Я хочу вернуться во Львов и в Жовкву. Мы можем сделать такой спойлер и, наконец, сказать, что такое Восточно-Западная улица и куда вы пришли по ней, в конце концов, от, какого, от какой точки до, до какой? Хорошо. Outside of Lviv is a small town which today is called Zhovkva, which used to be called Zhulkiev, and which, when it was a Soviet town, was called Nesterov. And that's where my grandfather's mother was born, uh, Amalia Flashner Buchholz. And so I went to visit that town, and I discovered something else that was remarkable. So I'm professor of international law, at the University of London. My first teacher of international law back in 1981 was a man called Elie Lauterpacht, the son of Hirsch Lauterpacht. Of course, I knew nothing about this whole story. As I did the research, I discovered that actually Hirsch Lauterpacht was not born in Lviv, He was born in Zhulkiev, Zhovkva, Nesterov. And remarkably, he was born on the very same street as my great-grandmother. The street was called Lembergerstrasse, the street to Lviv. But the great writer Joseph Roth called the street East-West Street. And so I've named the book in honor of the street on which my great-grandmother was born and on which Hirsch Lauterpacht was born. Uh, 
and that is the street that gives the title to the book. The street that leads from east to west. In Joseph Roth's writing, every small town has two streets, an east-west street and a north-south street. And so the two streets meet, and east-west street is the title of the book for that reason. И это путешествие, готовы ли мы сейчас сказать, что это путешествие из мира живых в мир мертвых? I'd say it's a trip from the world of the dead to the world of the living. Uh, it's the other way around. <laughs> you know, we think that things that happened a long time ago have no consequence, but it's not true. History has a long arm, and things that happened to family members long ago get passed on to different generations. I often ask myself the question, how could it be that me, a teacher of international law, a lawyer, would have uncovered this strange point of connection between Lauterpacht, Lemkin, my grandfather Leon, and the city of Lviv, L, 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 L. Was it just an accident? Was it just a coincidence? How do we explain that Lauterpacht's son was my first teacher? How do we explain that I worked with the son of Hirsch Lauterpacht for 30 years, and only then, after 30 years, did I discover that Lauterpacht's origins and my origins go back to the very same street of this small town. How could this possibly be explained? And the truth of it is that I think we have other ways of communicating. We don't fully understand how messages and stories and experiences and secrets get passed down the generations. I'm rather partial to the work of psychoanalysts who explain Torok and Abraham, who I begin the book with, that when a terrible thing happens, you bury the secret deep in a crypt inside of you. You close the door, you lock the key, you throw away the key, and you assume the secret will never come out. But the theory of Torok and Abraham, the two Hungarian psychoanalysts, is that what happens is the secret jumps a generation. It goes from the grandparent to the grandchild, and the grandchild finds a way to unlock the door by means and by ways we do not fully understand. And in this way, experiences get reopened and pass across generations in very complex ways. Мне невероятно интересно то, что я сегодня слышу. Я, в общем, как уже было сказано, книгу читал очень внимательно, поэтому не то, что меня сегодня ждали какие-то сенсационные открытия, но мне было интересно послушать этот разговор. Я бы хотел только, пожалуй, задать дополнительный вопрос, точнее даже не вопрос, а прояснить, пока мы еще не прочитали красную линию Red Line. Филипп несколько раз говорит о том, что его герой хороший человек, неплохой человек, не нацист, и тем не менее считает своего человека отца неплохим человеком, что называется, достойным человеком, и радуется сочувствию во Львове деятельности его отца, каких-то там людей, которые... Реконструкторы, как ты сказала, Елена. И у меня вот вопрос, а насколько, не только с юридической, с юридической мне понятно, а с, професси... с я бы сказал, личностной точки зрения, 
воспринимаем не просто в качестве хорошего или плохого, а просто в качестве не чудовища человека, который де-факто оправдывает действия человека, который практически лично повинен в гибели ваших предков, ваших родственников, вашей семьи. Как получается абстрагироваться от этого и, и видеть какие-то положительные качества в этом человеке, испытывать к нему не только, я бы сказал, интерес наблюдателя, но и человеческий интерес и даже некоторую симпатию. Well, I mean, I, I want to be, I want to be very, very clear. Uh, I don't, I don't condone and justify. Horst's interpretation of history. Horst accepts that his father was involved in doing terrible things. His father was an SS governor. He sat at the top table. He was a man of absolute power. And Horst accepts he was involved in terrible things. For reasons that are complex, he prefers not to characterize his father as a criminal. And here is where, for me, it gets very interesting. So Horst, at some point, was very upset with Nicholas when we were making the film. Nicholas said, I think Horst is a Nazi, which Horst disagrees with, I disagree with, and Nicholas retracted it. And one day, Horst said to me, how can I prove, Philippe, that I'm not a Nazi? So I said to him, well, you have this incredible family archive, your mother's diaries, thousands of pages of letters between your mother and father. Why don't you give those diaries to a museum and all of the papers so that people can look at them and do research and form their own view? He said, that's a fantastic idea. Horst has always been very transparent. If I want to see a document, he gives me the document. If I want to see a photograph, he gives me the photograph. So the United, the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington became the depository of 10,000 pages of personal family archive. And Horst very generously said to me, Would you like the documents? Would you like a copy? And of course I said, yes. And so for five years, we have been going through the documents. It's all in German. We've been translating it, interpreting it, understanding it. And it's remarkable. It's the first complete family archive of a senior Nazi and his wife. And what fascinates me the most is the role of the wife. Because people forget that all of these men who did terrible things were mostly married, or they had partners. And I've always been fascinated to know, what did the partners do? How much did the partners know? How much did the wives know? How much were the wives supporting what was going on? And in all of this material emerges the secret to understanding Horst. Horst doesn't love his father. My opinion, Horst loves his mother. And because the mother loved the father, Horst has a sort of displacement in honor of his mother to find the good in his father. And that is the fascination for me of the rat line. The rat line ostensibly is about Otto Wächter and Horst Wächter. But who is the really most important character in the rat line and in the Wächter family? It's not the husband. It's not the son. It's the mother and the wife. Because the mother and the wife has a huge enabling role in the whole operation. And this, for me, is the heart of the rat line. Charlotte Wächter is the main character. And... I suppose in answer to your question, Baruch, I'm able to be generous with Horst because Horst for me is someone 
like my mother, he's the same age, was deeply damaged by the war. He is deeply affected by, if you like, the collapse of his entire family structure in 1945. There's a moment in the film, My Nazi Legacy, where he's describing his birthday when he was six weeks old, six years old, and he starts crying. It's one of the few times he's cried with me. And in that moment, I really understood that a horse is psychologically damaged by those events. And that is what allows me to be generous with him. But every time he says something to me that I disagree with, I can assure you, I tell him, I don't agree with that. That's not my interpretation. And you're wrong on those facts. And the book makes that very, very clear. Спасибо большое, Борух. Спасибо всем слушателям нашим в трансляции. Спасибо Елена Фанайловой. И самое большое спасибо Филиппу Сенсу, который нашел время представить свою книгу хотя бы таким образом. Пока и мы с нетерпением ждем, когда издательство «Книжники» переведет следующую книгу Филиппа Сенса. Продолжение этого замечательного детективного сериала. Желаем всем не болеть. И встретимся скоро онлайн. Спасибо.